this morning. Oh, good. Okay. I actually saw him yesterday. Talked to him for a little bit. Yeah. All right. I think it's time for us to begin our class this morning. We're glad that uh, all of you are here today. Uh, if you would like to open your New Testaments, we'll be studying from Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Good to have Kathy Brewer back with us today. If you haven't seen her, prayed a lot uh, for you and Royce too, and uh, glad to see you back today. All right, Hebrews chapter 6. Let's begin by going to God in prayer, and then we will pick up on our study. Holy Father, we're grateful to you that You've blessed us with uh, the opportunity to be here this morning. We're always grateful for opportunities to study and uh, increase our understanding of uh, of Scripture, and we pray that um, uh, that we'll be able to do that this morning as we study from Hebrews. We pray, Father, that um, that you would continue to uh, to bless. Uh, the congregation here. Uh, we pray for your blessing to be with our leaders. Uh, we pray that um, uh, the things that we uh, continue to do would bring honor and glory to you. We're thankful that uh, you have answered uh, our prayers with regard to many things. And we pray, Father, that uh, in all of our requests that uh, your will would be done and your name glorified. We pray, Father, that you would uh, bless those of our number who uh, are ill and uh, otherwise uh, in need of of your special care. We pray, Father, that each day that we live, we would uh, mold our character to be more and more like that of Jesus. And we pray all of these things in his name. Amen. All right, last uh, Sunday, uh, we took an opportunity to uh, kind of step aside from our uh, walk through the book of Hebrews and go back and uh, do a little bit of summary. So we summarized the first five chapters uh, of Hebrews, and now we're going to pick up uh, again with where we are uh, in the major part of our study with chapter 6. There are handouts uh, Uh, back in the back for chapter 6, if you haven't picked one of those up. But to properly grasp uh, the first part of chapter 6, we need to make sure that we uh, understand uh, where we were in the latter part of chapter 5, because the the thought continues into chapter 6. He doesn't, um, uh, you know, he doesn't change subjects there, uh, but he does... uh, Um, He does change a little bit of the emphasis, but it's based upon what happened at the end of chapter 5. And so if you'll look at chapter 5, beginning in verse 11, the writer says, Concerning him, or concerning whom, and the him or the whom, is Melchizedek, uh, that the writer has uh, likened to uh, Jesus and uh, priesthood. In other words, the priesthood of Jesus, how he serves as priest, is like uh, the priesthood arrangement uh, that involved Melchizedek all the way back in uh, Genesis chapter 14. And so he says, we have much to say about him, and it's hard to explain because you have become dull of hearing, sluggish of mind. And so beginning there in uh, verse 12 of chapter 5, he kind of steps aside from his line of argumentation about Melchizedek and the high priesthood and all of that, 
and offers a pretty stern rebuke uh, to the recipients of this letter because of their spiritual ignorance. And so he says in verse 12 of chapter 5, uh, as it pertains to the time, the amount of time that's passed, uh, you should be, you ought to be teachers. You ought to be in a position to, uh, to have already understood a lot of these principles and be in a position to impart knowledge to others and not have to have knowledge imparted to you about even uh, the, the basics of the oracles of God. And so he says, you know, though you should be here, you've actually gone backwards. You have need, again, of someone to teach you the things that are the first principles of the oracles of God, the ABCs. We'll say more about that in a moment. And then he gives the analogy in, in uh, 13 and 14 how those that, are, those that are infants partake of milk because their, their digestive systems are not capable of handling solid food. And we get that principle. But he said, you know, those that are mature are able to take of more than that. They're able to take solid food. And he says spiritually they have become uh, in need once again of milk. And so they've not only stopped their progress, they've actually regressed and are in need of the basic principles again. Uh, but those that are mature, those that have exercised their discerning abilities, are able to handle uh, the deeper things of Scripture. And so he's, he's rebuked them for where they are. But as we get into chapter 6, he's going to build on that. He's going to encourage them to move ahead, to not stay where they are, but to progress toward a state of spiritual maturity. And then he'll warn them that if they don't do that, here are the consequences uh, of not progressing in your spiritual growth. And so that's kind of where we're headed this morning in the early verses of chapter 6. All right? So let's look at verse 1. Therefore, all right, on the heels of this rebuke, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, or the elementary teaching of Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. All right. So he starts by saying, look, we need to leave what he calls the elementary principles. Now, when he says, let's leave the elementary principles, he doesn't mean by that, forget them completely. He doesn't mean by that, um, you know, that you never consider them anymore, that they're no longer a part of, of uh, you know, of, of what you uh, you know, what you study and, and uh, no longer a part of, of what we practice or anything like that. He's simply saying that just as a physical, just as a person physically matures, we need to spiritually mature and grow beyond just drinking milk. And I think we made this point uh, previously that if you have an adult whose who's physical system can only handle milk, then you know that there's, that there's something amiss there, right? If, 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 a, if an adult's system cannot handle solid food, something's wrong. And the same is true spiritually. If you've got somebody who's been a member of the body of Christ for, for some length of time, for years, for decades, and they haven't grown beyond the ability to understand even the most basic and fundamental principles of Christianity, then there's an issue, there's a problem there, a problem of a lack of growth. And so he says, we need to build on those elementary principles. And that term for elementary principles is the same word that he used in 512 that is basically the ABCs. Remember us talking about that in a previous class, that when you think about elementary school... In elementary school, you learn the basic foundational principles that allow you to then build on that to deeper knowledge of other things. Just like the ABCs, you're the alphabet, you learn the alphabet first, and that enables you to 
put those letters together to form words. And then you can put different words together to form sentences. Then you put sentences together to form paragraphs, right? And you just, you build from one to the next. Paul is talking, Paul, I do this all the time. I I don't know who wrote Hebrews. And I really don't know that Paul did. I don't know why I'd say Paul. I guess because he wrote half the New Testament, you, you tend to default there a lot of times. The writer is wanting them to recognize you can't stay in the ABCs. You can't stay just learning the basic fundamentals you need to build on that. So, leaving these ABCs, the elementary teaching of Christ could be teaching about Christ, could be the teaching from Christ. Um, You know, either, either fits. But he says, leaving those elementary principles... Let us press on. Press on means to get moving, all right? Let us, let's get out of this stagnant state and get moving beyond these elementary principles. Now, what he does is he's going to list these things that he considers to be foundational principles. He says, let's not lay again the foundation. When you think about that in terms of building something, um, You know, once you get a good foundation in place, something that you need to build a building on, once you get the good foundation in place, you don't go back and put another foundation on top of it. You don't keep putting foundation down. You get the foundation in place, and then you build on it the superstructure. So he says here, let's press on to maturity, completeness, not laying again the foundation. And then he lists six basic fundamental foundational principles. I don't believe this was intended to be an exhaustive list. In other words, I don't think these are all of the things that could be considered foundational principles, but they're, they're representative of the kinds of things that he's talking about. And so let's look at those. Not laying again the foundation of, and here they are, repentance from dead works, faith toward God, Uh, instruction about uh, washings or baptisms, depending on your translation. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, Laying on of hands, resurrection, and eternal judgment. All right? So he, he lists, though, here are some of the foundational principles that he says we need to eventually go beyond, build on top of those things. Let's talk about each one of them just briefly. First of all, repentance. Repentance from dead works. It's a fundamental principle of one's relationship with God. It really always has been. From the time sin entered the world, one of the things that God wants for us to do in response to our sin when we become aware of it is turn from it. All right? It's a basic fundamental principle. Lots of passages on that from Old and New Testaments. Um, one of the great Old Testament passages on that, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, there's repentance, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Um, Jesus taught about repentance. Remember Matthew 21, verses 28 and following, the parable that Jesus told about Uh, The father who came to his sons, he says to the first one, go work today in my vineyard. And the son said, I will not. The other son said he would, but didn't. The other one said, I won't go. But afterward, he repented and went, changed his mind and went. Uh, Acts 17, 30, Paul on Mars Hill. Times of this ignorance, God wants... Winked at, overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's fixed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. So repentance is a, is a basic, fundamental, foundational principle, an important one. Repentance from dead works, faith toward God. Again, another fundamental principle. It has been from the very beginning. God wants us to trust him. And the story essentially throughout all of history especially that part of history recorded in Scripture, has been, is is man going to trust God or not? 
from the very moment that God gave Adam and Eve instructions. Eat this, do that, don't do this. That's, that has been the question. Will people trust God or not? All right, and so faith toward God is important. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him, Hebrews eleven six. 6. All right, then he says, foundational principles, repentance from dead works, faith toward God, Verse 2, of the instruction or doctrines or doctrine of washings or baptisms. Uh, you can tell that there's some difference there from, uh, from translation to translation because some translate it washings, others baptisms. Um, it, is the, it, it comes from the same root word where we get baptism or immersion, but... Um, the, word, the specific form of the word that's used here refers most often to the, um, the Old Testament washings under the law. It's used again over in Hebrews 9. <clears throat> Verse 10. When the writer there is talking about um, uh, things pertaining to the tabernacle and all that Old Testament stuff. And he says, Hebrews 9, verse 10, they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of Reformation. <clears throat> um, so what's he, what's he saying there then? Are we talking about Jewish washings? Are we talking about New Testament baptism? It could be, essentially, maybe even a combination in this sense. He perhaps is saying that one of the foundational principles that Christians need to understand are the differences that exist between those Old Testament, Old Law washings and New Testament baptism. That there's a difference between those things. Remember, we're talking about the recipients of the letter being Jewish Christians. Okay? These were people who had a lot of instruction and understanding about the, that Old Testament system. And there were various washings under the law that were a part of that process or a part of that system. Well, now, under the New Covenant, you've also got a washing, okay? Uh, the washing of regeneration, as Paul will call it in, in Titus 3, verse 5. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. So there's a washing there that we simply usually refer to as baptism. So what's the difference between those Old Testament washings and New Testament baptism? Well, the writer of Hebrews may be saying in this passage, that's one of the fundamental principles that you need to understand, are the differences between that. Um, some have said, you know, perhaps it, it has to do with the fact that in the New Testament... Um, we do read about baptism, that, that term being used in different contexts, and, you know, we need to understand differences there. You've got uh, the baptism of the Great Commission, right? You've got references to baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, you've got references to, you know, Paul would even reference um, that uh, the children of Israel were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, 1 Corinthians 10, right? And so differentiating between those things are important and fundamental too. Johnny? I think 1 uh, Peter 3, verses 20 through 24 have a real good destination there. Because in verse 20 it says, The like people were at work mm. with Noah, eight souls were saved for water. Right. And he creeps into 21 and he says the same thing basically. And, and it says that uh, eight souls out of Noah's family are saved. And then, then the like people were into baptism Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, John was pointing out 1 Peter 3, verse 21, uh, and what Peter there has to say about the, the role of baptism uh, in the new covenant. And just like water was used with regard to Noah and his family and eight souls saved by water, uh, the like figure uh, whereunto even baptism also now saves us. And that is a fundamental principle. You got John's baptism, right, which early part of of, um, you know, when just as Jesus is coming on the scene and, and you have Acts 19 where you had some individuals baptized into John's baptism and 
Paul converses with them, and, and they realize that, uh, that they had evidently been baptized into John's baptism after it had become invalid, and so they were baptized into Christ and all of that. So you, you have all of those things are a part of basic fundamental teaching with regard to the Christian religion, and some of it how it relates to some similar act, actions that were a part of the old system, and so understanding those differences are important and fundamental. Then he talks about the laying on of hands uh, as one of these fundamental principles in verse number two. Um, you know, you read through Scripture and, and you find that there were a lot of uh, different circumstances where individuals would put their hands on another individual for a particular purpose. Uh, and, and every time that someone, you know, put his hand on someone in some kind of you know, official or special way, it didn't always con convey the same meaning. For example, uh, sometimes you have a situation where it, it just signifies the conferring of a blessing on someone. Uh, when, when Jesus accepted the children, Matthew chapter 19, verse 15, um, you know, let the, let the children come to me, and he placed his hands on them and blessed them. It was just kind of a, a signifying of, of the, the, the imparting of a blessing. Um, you, in Acts 13, Paul and, and Barnabas are set aside, pulled out to, uh, by the church in Antioch to, to go on their first evangelistic journey, and, and they separated Barnabas and Saul for that purpose. And the text says, and they laid their hands on them, and sent them on their way. It was, it was kind of an official kind of, we're appointing you to this task. And then, of course, probably the one that we're maybe most familiar with are the instances in the New Testament where hands were placed on individuals by apostles, apostles putting their hands on individuals to confer to them miraculous gifts. Uh, Acts chapter 8, uh, verse 17, one example of that uh, with um, uh, the Samaritans. And so you, you have... Uh, you have different instances of hands being placed, but they don't always convey the same meaning, and they weren't always for the same purpose. And then uh, resurrection, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Fundamental principles. Jesus taught it, John 5, 28 and 29, just one place, when he said, um, uh, don't marvel at this, for the hour's coming in which all who are in the graves shall hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good under the resurrection of life, those who have done evil under the resurrection of judgment. So resurrection, a fundamental principle. Uh, matter of fact, Paul would argue that with regard to the validity of the Christian religion, that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the fundamental principle. 1 Corinthians 15. If, if, if the dead are not raised, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised, then here are all the consequences of that. And among them, you are yet in your sins. We are of all people the most to be pitied. Okay? Uh, those that have died in Christ have simply perished. All those things that he lists, here are the consequences if Jesus was not raised from the dead. And so um, that, he says, is the fundamental principle. If Jesus was not raised from the dead at all, then... Christianity falls with its own weight. So it's a fundamental principle. And then, of course, uh, eternal judgment, judgment to come. We mentioned Acts 17.30 earlier about repentance and its fundamental nature. Well, Paul follows up that statement about God commanding all men everywhere to repent by saying, for we need to repent because He, God, has fixed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by that one whom he's ordained for that purpose, the one that he raised from the dead. All right, so resurrection, eternal judgment, all of those things are basic fundamental principles of New Testament Christianity. So the writer of Hebrews, back to Hebrews 6, he simply lists those things as examples of these are the kinds of things that are fundamental, they're foundational, they, they, they get the foundation in place so that we can then build on those things and come to understand deeper truths. But these Christians, he said, were in need of having to have all of these fundamental things explained to them again. 
because they had spiritually regressed. And so he says, we need to leave these things. We need to get them in place and build on them. And verse 3, he said, this we will do if God permits. That's our purpose. And God willing, we'll do that. Now, you get to verse 4, and continuing down through verse 8, he offers them a very uh, stern warning. That he basically says, if you don't, if you don't progress, if you don't mature, if you don't build on the foundation, here's the danger of, of staying in that condition and regressing. Verse 4, For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. Here's the danger, the writer says. That you, as a child of God, as a Christian, can place yourself in a position to where the blood of Jesus is not going to cover your sin. Now, let's walk ourselves through this. First of all, he wants to make sure, it seems, that they understand exactly the person, the kind of person that he's talking about. And so he lists these characteristics. In the case of those who have been enlightened, number two, tasted the heavenly gift, number three, been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, Number four, tasted the good word of God. And number five, tasted uh, the powers of the age to come. All right. All of those things are characteristics used to make sure they understand. I'm talking about Christians here. I'm talking about people just like you. Look at each of these characteristics. Those who have once been enlightened. That word enlightened means basically what you'd think it means. To have light... uh, poured out on something. Um, you know, to, it's the, to, um, you know, to walk into a dark room and you flip the switch and the whole room is enlightened, all right? So the light comes on. He's talking, of course, spiritually speaking. The spiritual light has come on, okay? It, you got it, okay? You understood it. And so it's a figure, this idea of being enlightened is a figure to describe them coming to an understanding of the truth, coming to an understanding of reality, spiritual reality. And I think it's being used as a, um, uh, a, a part of speech, that a, a grammatical construction called synecdoche. All right? You didn't know you were going to get a grammar lesson this morning? You thought you were through with English grammar? Um, a synecdoche is... When you take something, when you take a part of something and you use that part of something to represent the whole of which that thing is just a part. Okay? Give an example. Uh, If I were to say to Chuck, uh, Chuck, give me a hand moving this. Okay? Give me a hand. Now, do I mean by that, literally, Chuck, lop off your hand throw it over here so I can use it to help me move this. Do I just want his hand or do I want the whole of Chuck to come over and use his hands, his back, his feet, his legs, whatever, to help me move this? Okay, right? We understand what we mean by that. Though, literally, all I asked for was his hand. Give me a hand with this. Okay? That's synecdoche. You use a part of something to represent the whole of something. If I say, uh, you know, my, um, my uncle's a cattle rancher, and uh, out on his property, he's got 200 head of cattle. Now, do I mean by that, that strode across his acreage, he's got 200 cow heads laying <laughs> across the property? No, I, don't, I mean he's got 200 whole entire cows. But how did I word that? 200 
head of cattle. All right, so I use the part, the head, but representing the whole. All right, you find that literary divide. We so so we use it all the time. We just don't ever a lot of times because it's such a part of the way we communicate. We don't often just stop and kind of dissect it like that. But that's what we're doing. Well, you find that in Scripture too. That sometimes a part of conversion, for example, will be used to represent the, entire, uh, the entirety of the conversion process. The word faith is used that, in, in that way sometimes. Uh, sometimes the word repentance is used that way. Um, uh, in Acts uh, 11, as, as Peter is recounting what happened with Cornelius and his household and how they came to understand the truth and were baptized and all of that, he said with regard to them, God granted them repentance unto life. Well, he just highlights repentance. But does that mean that's all they did? No, he's just using that one part of the conversion process to represent the fact that they were converted to Christ with everything that's involved in that. I believe here and in another place in Hebrews that we'll look at in a moment, I think that's what he's talking about when he says, you who were enlightened. It doesn't just mean that they came to understand. It meant that they came to understand and actually obeyed what they had come to understand. Hold your place in chapter 6 and turn over to chapter 10. And look at verse 32. <clears throat> but remember the former days when, after being what? Enlightened. You endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle and so forth. When he says, remember the former days when right after you were enlightened. What does he mean by that? I think he means right after you became a Christian. Right after you were converted. Right after you embraced the gospel. You were persecuted and you endured that. So this idea of being enlightened, though it literally means to come to an understanding of something, I think it's also implied that not only did they understand what they were taught, they obeyed what they were taught. A part of the conversion process. And so, back to Hebrews 6, he's talking about those who have been once enlightened, okay? Come to an understanding, obeyed the gospel. As he continues, you have tasted of the heavenly gift tasted of the heavenly gift. First of all, tasted is the idea of experience. Um, you know, it's, it, again, it's, it's, a, it's a figurative use of the word. You tasted the heavenly gift. Well, is he talking about something that we literally eat? No, not any more than, than it means in the Psalms where the psalmist said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He means experience the goodness of God. And so you have tasted of the heavenly gift. Uh, it's, uh, the Hebrews writer in chapter 2 verse 9 says that Jesus tasted of death for every man. How did he taste death? Well, he experienced it. All right. So it's, it's a figurative use of the, of the word taste. So you have tasted of the heavenly gift. What is the heavenly gift? Uh, well, I think in the context of all of these characteristics that the writer is trying to get across, I'm talking about Christians, and I think it has something to do with that. Um, and I would liken it to how Paul used the word gift in Ephesians 2 verse 8, for example, in, in talking about how someone is a recipient of, uh, of God's grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is what? The gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 refers to salvation as, as a gift. I think that's probably what he's doing here. You have, you have tasted the heavenly gift. You have come to experience salvation yourself. Tasted of the heavenly gift. Have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. The word partakers there means one who shares with, one who is a partner with. So you have become partners with, if you will, uh, the Spirit of God. I think that goes hand in hand with this, uh, this idea of salvation, uh, which is what I think the context of this is. Uh, you know, becoming a recipient of the Spirit is a part of becoming a Christian. I believe that's what the gift of the Holy Spirit is in Acts 2.38, is the Spirit Himself. Um, Galatians 4 verse 6, because you are sons, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Um, you know, a lot of passages on that Paul will refer to in 2, in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, what he calls the fellowship of the Spirit, a partnership with. 
non-miraculous, I believe, but, but real nonetheless. So if you have been enlightened, you've come to an understanding of the truth, you have tasted of the, the heavenly gift, you've had your sins forgiven, you've become partakers of the Spirit, you have the Spirit Himself uh, dwelling in you, you have tasted the good Word of God, all of that's in the process of our being obedient to God's Word. Again, tasted, the idea of experiencing. And you have tasted of the powers of the age to come. We talked about that phrase, age to come, uh, previously when we were in chapter 2. It's a Semitic uh, term, a Semitic term that they use to refer to the age of the Messiah, which the New Testament age is. And they had, they had tasted of the powers of the age of the Messiah. I believe that would probably have a reference uh, to um, uh, some miraculous manifestations that were a part of first century Christianity. They had seen that themselves. They had, they had witnessed that. They had experienced all of that. So you put all of that together, and I think it's clear he's talking about, and he wants them to understand, I'm talking about you people. I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about all the people who have experienced all of these things. Now, he says, now take that person who's experienced all of that stuff. And then he says, now, if that person falls away, verse 6, and we need to understand what he means by that, fall away there means to abandon a relationship, to commit apostasy. Okay? And when we talk about committing apostasy, we're talking about someone who turns their backs, if you will, on God, on the Son of God, turns their back on God's will to pursue a different course for their lives. That's apostasy. He's not talking here about the momentary individual sins that a faithful Christian commits in the process of them walking with the Savior and walking in the light, 1 John 1, 7. Okay, he's not talking about those scenarios. He's talking about the person who abandons the relationship completely, turns his back on Jesus to pursue a different course of life. We can pursue a course of life that has us walking every day with the Savior, walking in the light as He is in the light, 1 John 1, 7. And in the process of our doing the very best that we can to live as faithfully as we can, we're going to mess up. We're going to stumble. We're going to have moments of weakness where we give in to temptation and we commit sin. It doesn't mean that we've turned our backs completely on the Lord. It means that we're weak. Okay? And, and we struggle, and sometimes we give in to temptation, but we're still trying to live the best we can. And when we realize that we've got sin in our lives, we deal with it. We turn from it. We confess it to God. All of that is a part of the process of living faithfully and walking in the light. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about people who are turning their backs completely on Jesus and saying, I'm not going to follow him anymore. Now, and isn't that the context of Hebrews? Isn't that who we're talking about in this letter? Are people, some of whom who had already decided, I don't want Jesus anymore. I want that old system. I want to go back to the law of Moses. And some of them who had not yet actually done that were thinking about it. Okay, so he says, if you have embraced the gospel, embraced Jesus Christ, embraced all of that, and you commit apostasy, and you turn your back on all of that so that you can pursue a different course of life, and specifically and in context, pursuing a life in which you're trying to find justification under Judaism. He said, it's impossible for you to be renewed again under repentance because, and notice this, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. Crucify and put, okay, the two principal verbs there are present tense. 
in, in the Greek text, which refers to action in progress. Okay? In other words, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance because they are crucifying the Lord afresh and they are putting Him to an open shame. If that's what you've decided to do with your life and you've turned your back on Jesus Christ and you are, present tense, pursuing a life separated from Him and you are pursuing a life of trying to find justification and salvation in Moses' law, you can't be renewed under repentance doing that. You you can't find what you're looking for doing that. You can't find salvation doing that. Okay? If you are in the process of crucifying the Lord afresh because you've turned your back on Him and you're putting Him to an open shame because you basically said by your actions, He's not worth it. I've got something better in Judaism. And so you're showing shame and contempt for the Lord. How do you ever expect to have your sins taken care of while you're in the process of putting Him to shame? I think you've got a similar thing expressed later in the book in chapter 10, verses 26 and following. For if we go on sinning willfully, okay, there's your present tense, there's your action in progress. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving a knowledge of the truth, enlightened, chapter 6, after receiving a knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Okay? If you're going to go on sinning willfully, and again, you can't just pull this, yank it out of its context, all right? In context, what were the people that he was writing to, in what way were some of them sinning willfully? In going back to Judaism. If you continue to do that, there is no sacrifice for your sins. Not in that system. Now, could somebody who had at one time turned their back on the Lord and pursued that life, could they wake up to that reality and turn back to the Lord and find forgiveness? Well, sure they could. So what he's saying is, as long as you continue on that path, the path of trying to find justification in Judaism, there is no sacrifice for your sins. Jesus died for your sins, but you've turned your back on Him and you've pursued this line of of justification. There's no sacrifice in that for your sins. The sacrifice for your sins is over here. And so if you want that, you've got to turn yourself back to Him. Paco? I think principally it can be anything. If you've, if you've turned your back on the Lord and, and have pursued another course of action, it doesn't have to be Judaism, okay? Uh, if you try to find justification in something other than Jesus Christ, then yeah, you're not going to find that. So yeah, I think, it, I think it could have a broader application. But contextually here, I think that's mainly what he's talking about. John, did you have a comment? Yeah, All right. Yeah, Joshua twenty four fifteen. Johnny brought up about you know the ultimately the choice is going to be ours. We can we can serve other gods or we can serve the God. And uh, Joshua, of course, made made the right choice. All right. So in verses seven and eight, we'll finish here. The writer is is going to use just a, a common uh, example. Kind of, you know, almost a parable, if you will, where he says, look at it this way. Ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, and brings forth vegetation, fruit, useful to those for whose sake it's tilled, receives a blessing from God. Okay? So he says, look at it this way. The ground that receives the rain and produces vegetation and fruit blesses people, and that ground essentially receives a blessing, all right? On the other hand, verse 8, if that ground, instead of yielding good vegetation and fruit, yields thorns and thistles, then that ground's basically worthless, close to being cursed, and ultimately ends up being burned. Well, how does that fit into context? Well, it fits in this way. In order for the recipients of this letter, to fit into that first category, 
of being ground that is truly blessed and that produces fruit and vegetation that, that even blesses others, then they have to go on into maturity, not laying again the foundational principles, but moving on and understanding these deeper principles and growing and maturing. What, what, what is a sign that uh, a fruit tree is growing and healthy? It's got fruit on it. Yeah, it produces fruit. Okay, so if they want to show themselves to be fruitful, growing, healthy, then they need to go on to maturity. But if they stay back and, and they're not producing fruit, but instead they're producing thorns and thistles and weeds, well, that shows again that there's a problem and the ground needs to be cultivated and all of that, else it's likely to be burned. It's good for nothing. Okay, so his point is, if you want to be the good kind of land and good kind of fruit, then you've got to go on to maturity. You've got to press ahead. You've got to grow and increase your understanding. All right? Now, he's rebuked them in chapter 5. He's warned them, first part of chapter 6. Now, beginning in 6, 9, he's going to encourage them. And he's going to say, but you know what? We're persuaded better things of you, verse 9. In other words, I, I, you know, you got this. You're going to be okay. I've got confidence in you. And that's what we'll look at starting next time. All right, thank you much.